Hello, Braxton. I am hello. I am so grateful that you would interview with Hidden, a true crime podcast or Hidden True Crime. Uh, I have seen your two interviews that you have done. You are Lori Vallow Daybell's first cousin. You're close to her. Uh, Thank you for the interviews you have done. And thank you for doing another one with us because those interviews left me with a lot more questions. Mm. And I feel like you are someone I have been waiting to interview when it comes to perhaps understanding a little bit more the belief system of Lori Vallow Daybell, as well as where she got some of these ideas and, and understanding uh, prepping. First off, Braxton, just explain a little bit about who you are and how you know Lori, your her first cousin. Yeah, first cousin. So my entire family was from Texas. Uh, my mom and my aunt Janie, who is Lori's mom, they both moved to Southern California together and uh, both got married and raised our families, raised their families there. So really on my, on my mom's side of the family, it was just um, Lori, Adam, Alex, uh, Summer, and me and my two brothers and two sisters. So they were, we were only cousins that were by each other. Everybody else was in Texas. So kind of those only cousins we had on that side of the family. Okay. And then to get some background, you're Janice Cox's sister's son. Yes. And Janice was a convert to the church. Does that yeah. mean your mother was too? Yeah. To LDS church? Yes. Okay. So it was your... Um, your- mom was baptized... Uh, they joined the church when she was uh, seven, almost eight, and then just immediately got baptized. So that's okay. how old my mom was. My Aunt Jenny was a little bit older. Okay, right. So she was the younger sibling. You know, the things I've learned so far from watching your other interviews are that you and Lori were very close when it comes to the prepping community. And that's what I call it. And if there is a better word no, for it's it. that... Yeah, for sure. There isn't a better word for that. Okay. Okay. The prepping community, you know, uh, let me even go back a little bit. When, when this case first hit the media and just, you know, I've been following this case since December, 2019, when it hit the media, when Tylee and JJ were missing Mm -hmm. and I, I was living in St. George, Utah at the time. And I just, I had just recently quit reporting and I was really intrigued from the very beginning and trying to understand and trying to help trying to learn. Uh, you and I come from similar faith backgrounds and unlike you, I did not know anything. I had never heard of Julie Rowe. I did not know anything about the book visions of glory. I did not know Chad or Chad Daybell. I didn't know of a preparing a people conference. I didn't know of, a vow, which seems like a strong prepping community. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I didn't know about all these things that I was going to soon learn about and delve into and read. But, and you and I talked before this interview, and I remember when I said that to you, you said, really? You didn't know? And I was like, no, it was all new to me. So I guess I, first off, I just want to set the stage and kind of understand this aspect of your faith a little bit more? Well, every Christian religion, you know, talks about Jesus's return, the second coming, and it's always talked about. And of course, it's talked about in the Mormon religion because Jesus returns is a big deal to the Mormons also. Um, A lot of Mormons are preppers only because our prophet talks about it a lot and used to. They haven't lately in the last few years. It's more a spiritual preparedness more than physical preparedness. But growing up through the 90s, 80s and 90s, uh, it was all physical preparedness. And that's really what got me into it. Um, More now, you know, uh, the church is really about spiritual preparedness. So a lot of us in the church that um, are preppers, you know, we all talk about it and we're amongst it. So when these books came out, we all talked about it in church, not 
not over the pulpit or not in Sunday school class, but uh, as each other, you know, uh, like-minded uh, other Christians that are preparing. And so that's why it got around. And not enough Mormons, I guess, didn't hear about it because they weren't into that as much. I've always been into it. So in other words, side conversations at church, not, yeah. as you say, yes. not, the, not the pulpit and not in Sunday school, but like someone pulling you aside in the hallway and saying, hey, hey. you read this near-death experience book. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, okay. That's helpful. That makes sense. Yeah. And people kind of know who's into it. So you kind of know who to pull aside, would you say? That's fair. Yeah. Like I, I have my friends that are huge preppers, our own little... Uh, prepping community that we talk amongst each other. We send each other stuff on phone um, and talk about it and do stuff together. So you talked about the difference between uh, spiritual prepping, physically prepping, and so that everyone knows where I'm coming from. My family did have some food storage in case of emergency, mm -hmm. you know, maybe have um, a three week supply, uh, take care of your family. We'd buy maybe have a few cans. <laughs> That's what I know as prepping. So, so what does prepping mean to you and your friends then? Uh, I've taken it to the next level, of course. I've always been worried about not having anything for my children if they were starving uh, and not having resources. I'm a huge planner. I'm like that even today. Uh, if I plan for a trip that's four months ahead, it's it's all planned out four months ahead before four months before we go. Um, I will be my wife and I are usually done with Christmas shopping by September 1st. That's just how we are. And so prepping is like that for me. So I went way above and beyond. My children have grown. They've grown up being preppers. Um, we all did a TV show on National Geographic's of doomsday preppers. And my family was on it. They, um, I talked to them and helping them and uh, judging and the other contestant or contestants, the other um, people on the show, the first season. And then I have three boys, three girls. So they always called me the Brady Bunch of preppers. So then the producers called me and instead of asking me questions about the people that are on the show, they said, hey, Braxton, we really want you on the show as the Brady Bunch of preppers. <laughs> so I didn't even talk to my wife and I said, okay, let's do that. This is what we'll do. And then I told my wife, I'm like, Hey, just so you know, the production team is on a flight right now. They'll be here in three hours. We're going to do spend three days of filming the show. <laughs> so I, but um, I've kind of taken the level. So just to give you an example, I mean, it's, but I have six kids and then I have grandkids. So um just give you example, like wheat, I have 1,800 pounds of wheat, um, 900 pounds, wow. Um, I have a bedroom, that's the tuts in my house. It's the size of two bedrooms. It's just a huge, huge room. And it's packed full from, it looks like grocery store in there. Um, 300 gallons of diesel fuel stored on my property, uh, 250 gallons of fuel, 1,000 pounds of coal, um, different ways of cooking. I mean, I've got it all planned out. So I'm a little more extreme than usual people. Uh, more extreme than your fellow prepping friends? Like, would you say you're kind of like the king yeah. of this? Spent more money, definitely. They've prepared also. Um, I was really into pre prepping in, uh, I started in 2001 when I really got into it after the 9-11 tax. And I kept talking to my friends, hey, we need to be prepared for this if anything else happens. And they were just him haunted. So I, I wrote a letter explaining to my friends, like, some of the things that we need in this area to be prepared for earthquakes, um, flooding. This is in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, we, we sit on a huge fault, um, drought. I just prepared a couple, of, wrote That's it down, and I kept writing and writing and writing. And after a year, I had 380 pages and ended up being a book. And that's how I started being recognized as a prepper. And it was, you wrote a book, you wrote a book called a letter to my friends. And that's how National Geographic got a hold of me because of that. And that's how I, I started that. And after we did the show on National Geographic, I did seven more TV shows on prepping. 
And um, from other countries, the Netherlands came out and we did a film to show. Sweden came out, we filmed a show. And then uh, I spent about six months traveling the country with National Geographic uh, promoting the show. So we did Good Morning America, uh, the Today Show, uh, Fox and Friends with Megyn Kelly. Anderson Cooper had me on on CNN and interviewed me and my wife. Um, Jeff Probst from Survivor, he had a TV show and we uh, interviewed with him. Uh, Inside Edition, and then I did like morning shows, Good Morning Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Miami. I think I did 53 Good Morning shows and like 120 radio stations. So we just kind of promoted it and they thought I was a good candidate to promote National Geographic's Doomsday Preppers. So we did that in 2012, 2013. Um, actually, I was on the front page of USA Today as a prepper. That was really cool. Uh, a couple magazines. I did it. Uh, I had a four page spread in men's health. So I did a lot of stuff on prepping because I guess I was a good bass ambassador for them. So yeah, I'm a little bit more than everybody else on extreme prepping. Okay. No, that makes sense. And that, that is a helpful understanding. And so when this was happening, a lot of this publicity for your prepping, um, what year was this then? Um, the show aired in 2012. Okay. The promotions in 20, uh, 2012 and 2013. Oh, uh, Lori must have been super proud of her, her like-minded yeah. cousin. Was she? <laughs> yes. <laughs> she probably thought it was pretty funny at first, but yes. Most did you guys have conversations about, I know you had conversations about prepping and we're going to get into that, but did you guys have conversations about your publicity and your touring around and those and all this stuff we did? Yeah, I did. Yeah, of course we did. And my family's just like, Oh, Braxton. What did she say? What did Lori say? Um, she thought it was funny and exciting, you know, and, uh, and all my family thought that it was, it was fun and exciting for me, but they're like, you're just a little too crazy is all they thought. <laughs> So you mentioned um, the 9-11 attacks, uh -huh. you've mentioned earthquakes. I do want to say it is true that Salt Lake City is on a very large fault line. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in that area, I remember watching movies in elementary school and one movie was called Not If, But When, uh -huh. and it was earthquake preparedness. Still promote uh, that, that same thing, if not when, yeah. 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 And that's, that's how they taught us how to get under our desks was this. I remember like being like 12 going, what? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, but, but what else, um, what else, any national dis disaster or is this the second coming? You mentioned the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the book of yeah, Revelation. But um, I, I prepare for all natural disasters. And that's what I try and tell everybody to do because they have natural disasters in those areas. And then you're still planned for the second coming, which is basically the same thing. You know, a lot of people think, I talk to a lot of Christians that think, oh, the second coming, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome because, Jesus Christ is going to come and wipe the wicked and we're all going to be just brought right up to heaven. And that's actually not how it's going to be at all. And so when I talk about this in my book and um, in the book of Revelations, there's uh, seven years of tribulation and there's three and a half years of tribulation and three and a half years of great tribulation. And in that three and a half years of great tribulation is when the Antichrist will rule and reign the earth. And so I said, it. I talked about, um, let's just say the people that are going to be here for the second coming, you know, a million people. I don't know. I just said that. So if there's a million people to be here when Christ comes and there's eight billion people, that means in the three and a half years of great tribulation, seven and a half million people a day will have to die to kill seven, 8 billion people on this earth. That's going to be horrific. Now that's I'm interpreting book of revelation. Yeah. The seven years of tribulation. I'm yeah, just seven years of tribulation. Okay. Uh, um, now I don't know how many people are going to be here on earth. I don't think I'm going to be when Jesus Christ comes, but um, it's just going to be a horrible, horrible time. So that's why I really want to prepare. And I want my friends to be prepared. And Lori, Louis talked about it. All the time. Yeah. Speaking of Lori, 
I, I want to make one thing clear too. Maybe you can help us make something clear. You know, Chad Daybell allegedly predicted the end of the world. And that, that gets a lot of people confused. Why would they need millions of dollars and prepping if the world was ending? And I think you tell me if I'm right. I've always kind of explained it is I don't think they were thinking the world was going to blow up. I think that perhaps they considered the tribulations beginning, but maybe you can help me know if I'm right or help any of us understand. The last time I talked to Lori, we actually talked about the tribulation and she knew it. Uh, she knew there was going to be a lot of tribulation and stuff, but she thought she was safe in Rexburg. And a couple of books talk about Idaho being pretty secluded away from the, a lot of catastrophe. And that's why she thought she wanted to go to Rexburg is because she really felt she was safe up there. She's gone purely off the books that other people wrote. And these are other people's visions and dreams. Um, and they're awesome to read. And I think maybe there's a lot of truth to it, but she took it to the next level on that. So she automatically assumed being in Idaho, she's going to be fine. Uh, I have so many questions. What, but to go back to that, what do you think Lori and Chad were preparing for when, if he's stating the end of the world is July, I believe it was July 22nd. 20 2020 mm -hmm. was he preparing for the world to blow up or was he preparing for seven years of tribulation like what I'm not they preparing never, for? i never talked to her about that date uh and i never talked to chad obviously about that date. i just talked about Lori when i did talk to chad um i have no idea why they they said that now and of all the books you have all the dates and everything that they think it is and a lot of it is you know a uh, financial collapse in September or October. Um, I think three or four of the books that people have dreams are talked about that as a financial collapse. So a stock market collapse. The following year of the same month, September or October, it was going to be a, a dollar collapse where it's worthless. So I'm not quite sure where they came up with that. I don't know if that's a date Chad made up by himself. I'm not sure. I never once talked to her about that date. I think he just made up that date. Okay. And what, what happens at the end of the world? Like, is that it? Or is there? No, no. That's... I, so this is, let me, let me go back a little bit. The book of revelation isn't understand stood by that many people truly, no. or, or the second coming, including those that are religious, those that are LDS, those that are Christian. You ask, what does the book of revelation mean to you? You get a variety of answers. It's so, always... so I guess what I'm asking is I genuinely, I'm asking like you meant it was very helpful when you said the days of tribulation, seven years, but I don't know what that means. The end of the world. Does that make sense? I don't yes. know. Seven years is when Christ comes. Now we don't know the date. It says in the Bible in the book of Revelation, it says in Matthew and a lot of them, it says we don't know the date of the Christ, but we do know there's the seven years of tribulation before Jesus Christ comes. And it's kind of wiping the wicked off the earth. Um, so the thing is with Lori, I have no idea what came up with the July. It had nothing to do with any of the books that she read or um, um, was published by Chad, by the people in these authors of these books and their dreams. Um, but I do know they really thought there was the start of the seven years of tribulation will be start with an earthquake, a very big one. And it's supposed to be in the fall of the year. So you're talking October, November. Okay. That's when the big earthquake is going to come. And then the next spring is basically the seven years of tribulation starts with that one earthquake. This is what they've read in the books. And I know this, and I know they felt like this because I talked to Lori about it several times. So I think they really thought that the earthquake was going to happen. The huge one. And nobody's going to be paying attention to where the kids are or what's going on. Is this the same earthquake that Julie Rowe talks about? Yes. So when you say the books, the books, what do you mean? When you say I'm talking uh, Julie Rowe's book. Um, um, uh, Michelle McDermott put one together. Hector Sosa. Um, the Visions of Glory. Uh, Through the Windows of Time by Susan Freeman. All these books. Suzanne Freeman. We've interviewed Suzanne on our channel. Oh, have you? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, never talked to the lady, but she seems really nice. Um, but uh, 
so they all talk about the earthquake that's starting the seven years of tribulation. They all have that same, same thing that the earthquake starts the seven years of tribulation. So I personally, I don't know this, but I personally believe that's what Lori thought in that fall, we were going to have an earthquake. Okay. So they were waiting for the big earthquake. Oh, thank you for clearing that up. That, that was helpful. That's what they were waiting for. Uh, um, you know, all these books, you mention so, so there i actually need to understand these books a little bit more because this is this is the genre i'm gathering and again this is the genre i did not know existed until this happened despite being raised in a similar faith as you mm -hmm. but it seems like it's somebody discussing their near death experience in which they then have visions of the second coming of christ or the days of tribulation or the or the collapse everything you mentioned that's what I'm gathering. And would is that fair? Yeah. Okay. So d is that a normal thing for a near death experience to have the visions of the catastrophes or the days of tribulation? No, well for these what six individuals it was. Okay. They saw the end of the world. Um <sighs> Have you had these visions by the way? No. no. Okay. But do you believe, do you believe everyone that does have them? Um, with a grain of salt, you know, it's their experience. And just like you and I can go to a movie and then when we get home, we could explain what we, what that movie interpreted and yours and I is completely, completely different, 100% different of what we watched in the same movie an hour ago. And I believe the same with these people, you know? They had a vision and they explain what they saw, interpret it, what they saw. It doesn't mean I would explain the same thing, but they're entertaining and I do like it. It feel, mm -hmm. I feel like I do have a little bit of um, a look into the crystal ball, so to say. Okay. And are, are you friends with uh, the people, Julie Rowe, Hector Sosa, you mentioned Suzanne Freeman, Michelle, is it Mc Mc Michelle McDermott? Mm -hmm. uh, are you friends with any of these people? Yeah. No. Well, yeah. Um, not all of them, but yeah, I am friends with some of them. Michelle McDermott didn't write a book. Just to clarify, she didn't write a book. She just put all these books together in a book. You know like, a, I mean? like a pamphlet of the genre yeah. that I kind of uh, mentioned. It's just called The Great Gathering by Michelle McDermott. And she basically took everybody's um, dream or vision they had and wrote a book and she kind of put it together and how they all kind of lined up. It's pretty interesting. Okay. I will have to check that out. It's sort of like, I don't even know what to call the genre, the, the near death experience doomsday, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, sort of like doomsday visions through near death experiences. Um, you know, so, so a lot's happened since, since 2012, when, um, since your publicity tour and um and i'm gonna get to some conversations you and Lori had have, have had soon because i'm sure that people are are actually dying waiting for me to get into your relationship with Lori. so everyone i will but i'm just you are helping me answer so many questions right now so thank you braxton a lot has gone on in your family since this time though a lot of tragedy and i and i want to say i'm I'm so sorry. It, it's affected the world. I don't, I don't personally know how it's affected you. And so I'll, I'll say that, but a lot of Lori's trial and the documents from police and things I've read and her relationship with Chad revolved around a lot of the books you mentioned and a lot of her belief system and in and in text, she states that she believes her children are zombies. You you did mention something. I wrote it down in quotes that a lot of the books, you know, the second coming is wiping the wicked from the earth. Mm -hmm. With Chad, she states that, you know, Tylee and JJ were, were zombies. And, and let's let's switch that term because because I I've never heard that term until them. And I think you haven't either. But no. let's switch that term to to the wicked or to those you know, to a possessed spirit or something more familiar in Christianity, you know, less walking dead, more biblical, you know, 
does this affect, has this affected this tragedy in your family and, and Lori, knowing Lori, has this affected your beliefs? No, it hasn't affected my beliefs at all. Um, as tragic it is, it hasn't changed anything about me, you know, and what I believe in what I do. Um, I think I do want to address the zombies though. I never once ever in my life talked to her about that. She never said that once. So that what I could guarantee 100% that didn't come from her. That was 100% Chad. Okay. So that was never, I believe ever. you on that. I do believe, cause I do believe that he is the one who created. He had, that to. Term. He had to, he used it on a vow. That's the earliest I can find is that he used it in comments on the website of vow, which mm -hmm. was a large prepping website, but <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So Val, I was, um, um, you had to be invited to that, to be into it. Anybody can read it, but you had to be invited in to be a part of it. And I was invited. Of Val. Yeah. And after a little while of looking at it, I'm like, mm, this is, I didn't like it. I can see, I like to keep it straight and uh, straight and narrow with my religion and prepping and making it hand in hand. And they tended to go off a little bit. And I have, and I have a, um, uh, what's it called? Um, an hypothesis why I think they did that. Like Chad, you know, Chad wasn't even a writer. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'd love to hear your hypothesis. Well, Chad wasn't a writer, right? He was a publisher. And when I went up, I, Julie Rowe did a, a thing after one of her books and did a talk and I couldn't wait to go. So I went, it was up in Idaho in Rexburg and I got a ticket to it. You had to be invited to it. They just want to let anybody in because she was having problems with people coming in and disturbing it. So I got invited in and got a ticket and I went up there and watched it. Chad Daybell was there and somebody said, cause I w wanted to have her sign one of my books and I was up there and somebody said, that's Chad Daybell. And I'm like, Oh wow. The Daybell publishing, you know, that's how I knew him. Now I got his books. He had three books. I think it was just three. And, uh, uh, I got them after this because I wanted to see his books and read them. And I got through half of the first one and it was, to be honest, it was just trash. I thought it wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't genuine. You know, if it's genuine and it was weird. So I didn't even finish them. I still have them, but I still haven't even cracked them open and looked at it. So that didn't get to you the way Julie Rose or no. Visions of Glory, Spencer, or I Tom that. Harrison's book. Okay. Right. I loved all those books. I enjoyed reading them. I felt lifted up and um, hope and a direction in my prepping a little bit with all of those books, not Chad's. Mm -mm. Okay. So you, do you say you kind of go with the, the, your gut? Like, you know, when you feel a book is. Yeah. Well, all their books were good, but then uh, following them after it kind of, they just kind of went off a little bit. So let me explain what I mean. When you have a dream, you have one dream or one vision and you write a book about it. It is so awesome and everybody loves you. Now, Julie Rowe, when I went to that um, gathering she did and she did a talk, it was packed there. I mean, packed. Is that the Rexburg Tabernacle? Yeah, yeah. I've interviewed many people that were there and they, they've all repeated the same thing. It was packed. I feel like I was there. Yes. It yeah, was it was packed. And um, it was so good. And I think when people get oh, uh, a good f following and people want more and they ask for more, you only had the one dream. You only had the one vision. But people wanted more because they just thrive on it more. And so you have to, you're not going to have another dream. You're not going to have another vision. And if you lie and say you do, everybody will know because it won't be genuine, I think. But they have to keep it going right? They have to keep the people interested and keep it going because they like the publicity. They like the attention. And so she kind of went off the rails a little bit and I noticed it right out right away. And I'm like, it, it turned me off. You did notice. Oh, totally. Totally. And then she kind of went sideways. So I stopped following her and everything. I still love her book. I still have it here in my library and I love it. Now, Chad, I think the same thing. Lori was in awe with Chad. Uh, I didn't see them together. I never, I honestly didn't even know they were together. 
Okay. She never said a word. Now I knew she'd met him. I know they talked. He's invited her, them over. Uh, they did stuff together. I knew all you, that. You knew that they were friends. And you, so you were talking to her right before tragedy struck then. Uh, no, not totally. Cause I didn't know when she moved up to Rexburg, that's when I, that's the last time I talked to her when she okay. just moved up there. But I mean, when she moved, it was two weeks later, Tylee was murdered after she moved up to Rexburg. Yeah. And I didn't, that, but my point is, sorry. So when was the last time you talked to her? I guess that's where I'm getting at. I'm uh, just trying to understand how she lived in Arizona. So, oh, not, wait, what was the year? Did you say? I talked to her when she still lived in Arizona. Okay. So I don't know. Before, um, um, but you knew that she knew Chad. You knew that she. Yeah, but I didn't know they were doing anything or involved at all. But um, what I was going to say is um, Chad, too, What he had a following. I mean, he was publishing all these books. He was coming up with his own ideas about everything, putting them all together and coming up with his own ideas. So people were starting to follow Chad and look up to him as uh, as a prophet. Let's say a prophet. For lack of a better word, I'm going to call it a prophet. And everybody's looking at him for direction and the future. Well, once somebody says they have the future, they have all the power in the world because everybody wants to know the future. And if somebody believes that you know the future, they're going to look at you with starred eyes and want your opinion and your direction. And I think he was going that way. So when Lori was giving that, was getting, giving him attention. And I got to tell you, Lori is very charismatic. You're around her. For five minutes, you feel good about yourself. You feel happy. She makes you feel like you're the most interesting person in the world. Like she makes you feel good. She makes you feel loved just talking to her. And you're exciting and you're funny. And you're even if you're not, she just makes you feel that way and says the things. Yeah. So I know, I know Chad was in, in, enamored. What's the word? Yeah. Enamored. Uh, yeah. Enamored. Just with it. I mean, Lori, I mean, everybody saw Lori in prison. She didn't look good. She didn't have makeup on. She didn't have her hair. She is stunning. She is stunning, beautiful. Um, she still had a six pack at 46 years old. I mean, perfect body, beautiful, loving, fun to talk to. And you felt good around her. I know Chad, like, oh my gosh, this is the girl. So he had to keep up that image of he knew the future and he knew what to plan for. And I think it spun off that way. I mean, they were definitely, um, one was a match and one was gasoline. And I've heard people say that too. I definitely, he had to keep it going. So he had to keep going and making up more and more and more stuff to keep Lori interested and the other people interested because I talked to him on the phone. Now this is after Lori's arrest. I talked to him. So I knew right. everything about Chad, everything that had been going on, it came out. Um, the family knew a lot of stuff and we were all talking about it. So I'm thinking, dude, this is a David Crest guy, you know, like can swoon people and they just w want to be around him and listen to him. And he called me because he was he wanted to bail out Lori and he wanted me to help bail out Lori. And I got on the phone with him and I thought I was going to talk to the guy I was even going to be impressed with. It was not at all that I thought. He was the most plain vanilla, soft-spoken guy. Didn't even have good words. Wasn't just didn't grab my attention. Blew me away how he was. And I'm like, what in the world did Lori see in this guy? And the the other girls, you know, that the whole group that followed him. I'm like, what in the world do they see in him? And the uh, eternal question. Yeah, I, I sat and thought about it, and it had to have been just telling people he knew the future and knew what was going on. So he's telling Lori, hey, look, the earthquake's coming. We all know it. It's in the fall, this coming fall. And then um, I don't know what's going to happen July the 22nd, I think it was. I don't even know what he was talking about. It was in none of the books. So he just made up his own thing. But to get back to the part about the zombies and stuff, he made that up. He had to have done it only because Lori never talked about that. Why he did that, I have no idea. And um, they had a list of all the people, the 144,000 that are going to be saved, you know, at the end of the world. Correct. More than that, but uh, that are going to be play a significant role in the end of times. Um, so, and they, 
they kept putting people on the list. My wife kind of and I joked and we're like, well, we hope we were on the list, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think he just had to keep going on with his lie and he made up dates. As far as I know, that's all I know. And I've talked so he, to So he authored the belief system and kept making things up. Not the entire thing, because I, you're telling me a lot of things that she believed, but but the extremes, the the zombies, yeah, the Which the end of the world, it's absolutely crazy. So when Chad called you, I've actually talked to a few people that have told me stories of him asking them to mortgage their homes or to. to um, it's fascinating to to get Lori out of of jail when she was originally put behind bars. Ironically, shortly after we see body cam footage of her reading Visions of Glory that we're going to talk about here. Yeah by the pool. Yeah. Um, she did not produce her children and she was put in jail. You said at that point you did understand what was going on and you were in touch with family members. And so you thought you were kind of dealing with a cult leader, David Koresh. W where was the family and where were you then at that moment? What did you think was going on at this time when the kids weren't around? Oh, okay. Well, Charles died. And I remember that phone call. My dad called me and said, Charles is dead. And I'm like, what? We were just there in Hawaii and we stayed with Lori, my wife and I for the week. In fact, oh, wow. um, Lori actually set my wife and I up. Um, quick story. I, she lived in Texas and I was single and I flew out there for a week to hang out with Lori and summer cause they lived together and, um, just to hang out for the week and visit. And she's like, Braxton, have you been on LDS singles? That's the Mormon church singles website and this is this is 98 97 98 and i heard war stories about people hooking up on the internet it was just brand new and i'm like right. absolutely not and she's like well i'm on it let's change my profile to a man and let's look up girls for you so we did that one night and there was a picture of my wife Kara on there and which was a very attractive picture so when i got home i emailed her and we got together and so my wife and Lori are friends too because that whole thing wow so um, she, she handpicked your wife for you well i'll be a single she picked like five or six girls and kara was one of them but kara's my wife kara just a stunning picture so i that was the only one i emailed yeah but yeah anyway Good. emailed the right one um <laughs> So yeah, wow! I can't imagine. So, so your yeah, your wife is dear friends with Lori too. I can't imagine then. So then again, where were you guys? So you'd learned that Charles, yeah. So he anyway, died. Back to my story. Char my dad called me, and Charles died, and I'm like, what? And he goes, Alex shot him, and I'm like, what? Why? And he told me the story that um, uh, Charles was harassing and stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't sound right. So the family got the story that Charles was on his business trips because he was a financial advisor. He was getting, um, this is the family story that I heard, that he was hiring hookers when he was gone. And I'm like, my wife and I look at each other and we're like, no, 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 that's not true because this guy was so stupid in love with Lori, stupid in love with Lori. Clearly. Yeah. And I'm like, that's, that, that's not it. And I'm like, how did Lori find out? And I, I actually was embarrassed. So I never even asked Lori about it. So this is what I heard from the family was she caught him on the credit cards. And I'm like, wait, and I asked my wife, I'm like, dude, cookers tech credit cards because everyone I've seen on the movie didn't have a credit card machine in their purse. Right. Right. I'm pretty sure it's a cash only business. So, so I'm like, like, like I, it just didn't add up to me. And so she was leaving Charles over it. Uh, I knew she was going to all this stuff, you know, um, the, the thing Chad Daybell was doing and in, in, in the prepper stuff. So I never put two and two together about it. So when I found out about that, I was just absolutely floored. And um, uh, I just, it just didn't make sense to me. All right. So when Lori had the kids, I know JJ, um, his family, I got the story. This is the story I kind of got. Yeah, you're the messenger sharing what you had learned from the family. Right. right. 
and that um, they wanted JJ back because Charles was dead. I'm like, okay, that kind of makes sense to me. You know, Lori is a phenomenal mother. She's just a great, great mother. And I've seen her be a mother, you know, or the whole life of her children. And I'm like, I was impressed. Her attitude, her patience, her love, everything I saw, she was just a super mom. And so um, they're like, um, the Wilcoxes want JJ back. And I'm like, that didn't make sense to me, first of all, because they didn't want him when he was born. You know, the Lori. Wilcox, yeah. Yeah, Lori took him, and and Lori's not going to let him happen. So she have, have them. So she's hiding them until the court is, you know, she can make sure she keeps them. And I go, okay, you know what? That made sense to me, right? Yeah. I would do. I if I had children, and well, I do have children, but if I had a child and it was adopted, and the other family wanted it back, and everything else, I would probably. I'm like, yeah, I could see that. I would fight tooth and nail. So the first little bit. I'm like, okay, I understand what she's doing. Now, I never called her and asked her about it, right? Um, Lori was kind of hard to get a hold of anyway. She was constantly changing her phone number. She was always doing phones. She was very James Bond about it. I have no idea why. She's always been like that. Okay. So um, at the end of this, when this was all going on, she kept changing her number and phones. It, it didn't throw up a red flag for me. Um, so the kids are hidden away including Tylee. Now, everybody's seen pictures of Tylee. A lot of people don't know what Tylee is like. Tylee, just a phenomenal kid, a great teenager, but she's a teenage girl and the loudest teenage girl you know. Not in a bad way. She's very loud, boisterous, boisterous, in your face. She has opinions, uh, a typical teenager, but she's a little more extreme. A girl of my own, probably like me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, she she's watching JJ. All right. And Lori's got him hidden away until this whole court thing is on. That made sense for me for about two weeks. After two weeks, I'm like, there's no way on God's green earth, Tylee is this quiet. Right. Thank she's you. not. Yeah. And um, so it flew, it, it just were bells were going off. Now, after this whole time, then Lori gets arrested. I'm like, this, I, my whole family's like, a lot of my family was like, well, Lori's still hiding the kids. And I'm like, mm, no. So my family was really split on this. Um, there was a lot of yelling and fights between my whole family because there's voice of reason and then there's people on Lori's side. Now, I get my Aunt Janie and I get Summer and I get my mom. My mom's being on my Aunt Janie's side. I understand. You don't want to think anything is bad to your grandchildren. So you're you're believing your daughter. I would do the same exact thing. But after that whole time, and then Chad calls me and wants to bail out Lori. At this moment when he called me, that's when I'm like, this is not right. So he actually called me and asked me, look, Braxton, will you put up your house for Lori? And I said, yeah, I would do that for Lori, but I don't know if I'm going to do it for this situation. I said, you know what? Let me think about it. And then he called me, I think it was two weeks after that again, and talked to me about it. And he had his cell phone and he had another cell phone. And he's like, hey, I got Lori on the line on the huh. other. Hold, so holding them both all, up. Yeah, okay. All three talked. And she wanted me to put up the house. And I'm like, Lori, you know, that's a big commitment because that's my biggest asset in my life. And uh, I talked to her a little bit about it. And then uh, we hung up because she had a certain amount of time she could talk on the phone. And then I was talking sure. to her like, look, Lori's not going to run or anything. And I said, well, no, because she's going to be under my 24 hour watch. She wouldn't run. But I said, still, Chad, this is a big, big deal to me to put up my house because I could lose that. He's talking to a prepper who cares about the safety of his family. You've got 18 billion <laughs> things of weed in your garage. Yeah. And You're not going to mortgage your home. <laughs> I have a good, good friend that was a federal judge here in Salt Lake. And I talked to him and I said, hey, do you ever have people that have ran after they've been put on bail? He gave me like 50 stories and like 20 of them still have the people have never found and people have lost their houses. So I'm like... If, if Lori asked me to bail her out the minute she was arrested, I would have said yes, because 
uh, I felt she was doing the right thing. And I'd ask her questions. I said, okay, tell me where the kids are and I'll let you do it. You know, mm-hmm. I've, I've hid them away in a cabin because I don't want the Wilcoxes to get them. Okay. I agree with that. After this amount of time, I'm like, Chad, I'm not doing it. Um, I just, I had a hard time at that point. And I'm like, so I go, I'm not going to do it. And then he called me the third time and said, hey, your Uncle Datto, can you talk to him and ask? Because Lori didn't have his number. Who's Uncle Datto? Uncle Datto is an uncle we have in Texas. That's worth a lot of money. And okay. so he wanted me to call Uncle Datto and ask. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, um, okay, Chad, I'll do that. And I'm like, I'm not asking Uncle Datto for anything. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Were that- you able that second phone? Oh, go ahead. Keep going. He- what did you say? It went out a bit. I talked to Chad, and then after that, he was arrested. Okay, so you talked twice. Three once. times. Oh, so he did call one more time to see if you talked to your uncle? Yeah, to ask. He called the third time to ask if I would call my uncle Datto in Texas. Gotcha. Which clearly Lori told him to do. Yeah. That second time when Lori was on the phone, and it was quick, it sounds like, were you able to ask her any questions? Like, where are the kids? No. And I didn't, I didn't want to get into that. Uh, I made the decision I wasn't going to, and I really didn't want her to lie to me. And I knew at that point she would. And so I didn't even ask where the kids were. Um, She wasn't going to tell me anything anyways. I knew that she was in jail. So they are all recorded lines. Right. So it was pointless for me to get into that. You know, I told her how sorry I was, this was all happening to her, how much I loved her. Um, the right thing will happen, you know, the stuff she wanted to hear kind of, um, but no, I wasn't going to get into any of that with her. Why? One of your friends, Hector Sosa, um, supported Chad a little bit longer than others. Were you in touch with him at this time? Yes. And what, I mean, what were those conversations like? Cause I know that he really wanted I, to believe in Chad. Chad published his book and yes. And they're friends for that reason. And he called me and asked me, he's like, why is Lori hiding the kids? And I told him my theory on that. And he, he believed it too. Like that's the most reasonable theory. You know, she was hiding the kids. Um, so they couldn't get to them, you know, the Wilcoxes, Wilcoxes. And, um, so yeah, he was with that too. And then, um, I don't know when he turned, um, last time I talked to him, we had lunch, I think in 2000, and, uh, 2021, we had lunch and talked about it. And then I haven't talked to him since about it. And did he come to the realization then in 2021, the truth? Yeah. He... So yeah, yeah. He was at 2021, I think. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. I know a lot of people had a there were a lot of people in Chad's circle that didn't believe it until the children's bodies because were found. That is a guy that could not convince all these women that they had these powers and to do this and murder and cheat on Tammy and kill Tammy. I mean, it's just, it, it was unheard of by his personality. So nobody would believe it did. You know, none of them did. Right. Like it almost would have seemed more possible had he been a boisterous, exuberant personality almost like the kind of just like i don't know those guys you know they had a more intimate relationship with chad i did not you know i only knew him as a person since what i don't know no no um 2018 i think it was you know because he was publishing the books that i loved so i didn't really have a person uh, a relationship with him like these authors did i'm sure they were very close because they spent a lot of time together yeah. And going back to those books and that I want to say like a lot of this, I think there's a prepping community, but there's even a tighter knit group when it comes to this sort of book group, this book genre, I keep bringing up the, the near death experiences have a vision of the last days books that were being written. The Julie Rose, the Chad, the Suzanne Freeman, uh, Tom Harrison, he's Spencer in visions of glory. Mm-hmm. And then that's those people sort of got together and I'm saying this to actually either get confirmation and validation from you or be corrected. So I'm stating this as a, you okay. tell me, this is what I feel. And then they all got together sort of at these conferences and the conferences that gave Chad Daybell his platform, as well as these other authors you mentioned are preparing to people, the firm expo and the website 
a vow or another voice of warning, but mm -hmm. you weren't into a vow. But did, but did you attend the preparing to people in firm? No, nope. you didn't. Never. Okay. So that wasn't everyone going to those. No, no. I knew about them, but again, like I said, kind of the straight off from what I know to be right. And I didn't like it. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's some popular voices speaking at these conferences. I know Tim Ballard is a speaker there. Um, Jason Mao. Did you ever mm -mm. know Jason Mao? Uh-uh. No. And I what about? At it either. And who? What did you say? Ballard. I didn't know he spoke at it. Yeah. I, I even just attended a firm expo where he was the main speaker. This is post, but I know that he was speaking and um, friends with preparing to people founders as well as um, the firm expo founder rod meldrum so mike and nancy james and then uh he was even speaking with eval founder um roger k young at one point mm -hmm. so it's just that you know so that's maybe where i gathered that there's sort of these like-minded groups maybe going to these conferences together but maybe it was just his speaking circuit i don't know maybe that's more of the speaking circuit yeah maybe so there are these, these conferences, you never attended them ever then. Mm -mm. Na you know, Lori liked to attend them. Did you ever know Melanie Gibb? No, I never met Melanie. Okay. And then did you ever know uh, Mike Stroud or attend a fireside by nope. Mike Stroud? Okay. This is helpful. It sounds like maybe you were more into the books than say the podcasting crowd too there's the kind of both oh i knew the podcast i didn't listen to it i knew uh lori had been on it a couple times but i never searched it out to listen to her on it um not because um any other reason was i just i didn't get to it i'm like oh yeah lori's on it. okay I'll, I'll have to check that out and it just never happened who would you and who would you and lori talk about together when you would talk about your like-minded beliefs when it came to the prepping community who did you discuss just the books nobody and, and which books which books um the biggest one was um visions of glory okay that was a just a great book um we liked talking about that one we talked okay. about it a few times a few times mm -hmm parts in the book and what we thought and what we interpret it when we read it. It was just fun, you know. Did she take it literally? Um, I think so. As I kind of do too, some of the stuff, you know, take literally, but um but for me it's all good and fun and um I think she just took it as scripture. And I think that's what a lot of these people did was take it as more as scripture than anything else. So, okay. I have so many questions. Thank you for delving into this. So visions of glory. You said you have your book with you, right? Do you have your book? Yeah, uh, oh, vision. I just pulled it out of my, um, thank you. My library downstairs. Yeah. That, that book, uh, became, uh, I've been, I've been reading this book. I've read it a few times now. Uh, I didn't know about it until this case. This is, that was research. So you and I talked on the phone even, and you said, well, did you like, it? I said, I have to be honest, Braxton. I read it very biased because yeah, I was reading it for research of this case. And so, so no, I, I, I have to admit, I didn't like it because I'm seeing all these similarities in the book that Lori's seen. I've seen similarities in Tom Harris and he's Spencer's beliefs and, and Lori's. We'll get into that in just a second. You know, this book though, I I've heard from many people. She liked it. And then it was definitely confirmed in trial when body cam footage uh, or cell phone footage, I should say, from Kauai police showed Lori reading it by the poolside when she was delivered the order to to present her children to the court. And then in addition to that, confiscated it and it showed it in in all of the the search of her vehicle that they had taken this this religious book. You know, it's it's really interested me for quite a while. I've talked to numerous people who have told me they felt that this book played a role to the point where I finally listened to it. And I, I can't help but see what they're talking about. I, I feel like this is where portals began. Everyone sort of made fun of Chad and Lori's belief in portals, but it's very clear that portals are all the rage and visions of glory. 
And that many people do take this book literally. I want to, well, first off, before we delve into some things in the book, and I have some recordings, um, but I want to play to you some audio from the book. But what's the difference between believing it's real, but it's all good and fun, and Lori believing it's scripture? Isn't scripture just believing something's literal? Believing that it's scripture is like basically from the word of God. That's how I look at it. And a lot of people look at, read that book and think it's like as, as much as scripture, you know, they put it on the same plane where I put scripture, the Bible, the book of Mormon, I put them way up above. And these are entertainment books. I think they brought the Bible and the book of Mormon and put them all these books together. And they, they all say the same thing. I didn't look at it that way. Okay. Um, right. Lace. Um, member of the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, where the Bible is the word. And so it doesn't give dates and vision and different things, but it's fun to read other people's opinion of a vision they saw and kind of put it to the Bible, like I did with the book of Revelations in the seven years of tribulation and different things. I think that's fun, but I think they put all those books as equals and then made up, concluded their own ideas. Okay. So, so to let our audience understand what visions of glory is, it was written by a man named John Pontius. And I've talked about this book several times. I started talking about it because we learned on the burner phones from the FOIA documents that some people were called, were plugged in as Spencer's wife. Spencer's wife was a name. And we know that Chad Daybell mentioned Spencer in the speech he gave the day he met Lori at the preparing a people conference in St. George, Utah. I had that speech on our channel that he gave and he mentioned Spencer from visions of glory. So yeah. you didn't know that. Yeah. I, I believe the 10 tribes have great gifts that we don't understand. And Spencer's book visions of glory. He talks about how they can just mold rock. <laughs> they can take a tree and tell it to be a chair or something like that. And the tree will obey. And so as the 10 tribes return with these gifts, we will build these cities quickly and magnificently. And, and maybe that's part of it too. When I listen to Chad's speech and when I hear visions of glory, I'm like this, they're saying the same thing. Yeah. So visions of glory is written by a man named John Pontius, but he's essentially like the ghost writer. He's yeah. writing the visions of Spencer. Spencer is an alias, but his real name is Tom Harrison which I can share because he has come out publicly multiple times. I actually grew up near the Harrison family. And uh, so Tom Harrison wrote this book, Visions of Glory. And he states at the, at the book that these are his visions that he had dreams, dreams and visions of the last days. And it's a near death experience book gone here are the visions of the last days. It's just one of the genre we keep talking about, but it's, it's in great detail. And he discusses portals. He discusses the days of tribulation. He discusses his wife dying uh, suddenly because he has another mission to fulfill. He uh, does share a, a chapter and I'm sure you know this. You've read it a few times too, where evil spirits are getting into a man who's looking at porn. They're getting into the yeah. top of his head. Yeah. And, um lots of books not just these books that we're reading a lot of books a lot of books the same thing and seeing to me he might not have used the word zombie but to me that's what a zombie is yeah maybe that's why they they called it a zombie they are saying the same thing but yeah uh yeah. there's enter through the crown of your head mm -hmm. yes and when you do evil things they're, they're going to be able to get in and they don't want to leave they want to take over your whole body yeah yeah. They I want, mean, to you know, me, that's a, that's a zombie. <laughs> yeah. They want to feel what humans feel because they, they're disembodied. They never had a body. And so they, in a moment of weakness, like drugs, alcohol, um, his example of porn, any of those, they enter through the crown of the head and they get to feel for a moment, human body emotions. Okay. That's what I get from all the books. Now, not just, these six books, um, back in the 
early 2000s, I was really into near-death experiences. And so I went to the library and looked for every book on near-death experience. I didn't want it to be a religious book. I just wanted people to have it. And so I found like literally 20, 30 books and I read them all about that. And they all kind of said the same thing about evil spirits roaming amongst the earth and entering people and and feeling the emotions and everything. So when he wrote that, I'm like, yeah, I get that from a lot of people. Now, Chad and Lori, if they wanted to call him a zombie, I guess they're calling a zombie because an evil spirit entered their body. But they took it right. a lot because uh, in Visions of Glory and other books, it was just for the moment, right? The moment of human weakness when like um, one book and I can't, it's escaping my mind, but it was a World War II um, pilot that died and had a vision. He died in the hospital and had a guide and walked around and he went to a bar and watched these evil spirits go through drunk men through the crown of their head and, and, and got to feel the emotions of their body for a moment. So when he said that in visions of glory, I recognized it. So I like that stuff because I believe that stuff too. Okay. A lot of yeah. Okay, and I and I read it differently. I felt like he was kind of implying that they were trying to stay in the body. That they, you're right. They they entered the crown of the head. They wanted to feel what this. Yeah, but they couldn't stay feeling, forever. Long. I guess but they wanted to stay and kind of take over his body. I'm sure they do, and I, and there's book examples of that happening in the Bible a lot of evil spirits taking over bodies. So let me let me just ask you point blank. Um, minus the term zombies, which I think we both think is ridiculous. Do you believe in 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 an evil spirit being able to take over a good person's body? If that person is allowing them to. Yes. And so, how does one allow them to? When you're drunk. Yeah that or you're playing with a Ouija board and inviting an evil spirit in and letting it take over your body. I believe that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And Lori believed it. Apparently, but they, yeah, they called it a zombie and, and uh, I guess the zombie stayed there and they had to do away with the person like her children. Is there any thought in your mind then that that could have happened actually to JJ and Tylee? no, no. And so, I mean, well, what's the difference? What keeps somebody from believing that? Do you know what I mean? Like believing that and then other people like realizing, I mean, I agree with you. I'm like, thank you. Like, no, no. But, but why would Lori believe that? I think the short answer to that is because she wanted to believe it. She wanted to believe it. She wanted to believe Chad was right. And she wanted to believe that this is all for a reason and he's correct. I think she wanted to. Now, let me explain something. When you're a prepper like me and you're preparing for one event, the second coming of the, and you spend hundreds and thousands of dollars preparing and having a plan and getting your family prepared and your friends prepared and you spend all this time and it consumes you and you do it day after day after day, you're, you are mentally like, I'm prepared, I am ready. There's nothing more I can do. Now I want to be challenged. I want to go through it and do well in it. Mm -hmm. And I think Lori was in that position where she talked about it every day. She knew what was going on. She was prepared. Chad told her the future and what was going to happen. She knew it. She had, she had a, a key to the future and it was Chad. And he's telling her and she's been preparing and talking about it and telling everybody it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And everybody around her is believing her that it's coming because Chad told me it's coming. She wanted it so bad, so bad she wanted it that at that point, she's like, I, Chad says this and I, and I want it to happen. I want it to happen. So I'm going to go past this envelope, go a little bit more and kind of help it along. I think that was her. Now that's my opinion on it. I don't, yeah. I don't know if she thought that, but that's explains to me how she did this horrific act. I, I value your opinions and, and I understand that you're sharing opinions and thank you. I guess my next question then is if, if she did that and she chose to believe that because of the reasons you suggested, do these beliefs in evil spirits entering bodies become dangerous? 
What do you mean they become dangerous? What do you mean by that? Well, you seem to have a level head and I say to you, you know, are JJ and were JJ and Tylee taken over by evil spirits and, and you smirking, you go, absolutely not. You know, no, of course not. Lori wanted to believe that. But allegedly she did want to believe that. And that's what she claims happened, whether we believe her or not. Do, so is that belief then just to have that belief that an evil spirit can enter a good body uh, if they choose it by sinning, I think is what you're saying. Is that a dangerous belief to have? Because not everyone is Braxton. Not everyone is healthy like you and can roll your eyes and be like, of course it didn't enter my child's body. You know, I love my child, but, but can everyone think like you? Like, is this not an unhealthy belief that we read in visions of glory or these other books? Yeah. I think mentally, mentally it comes into, you know, a little bit for the back of lack of a better word, a little bit crazy. And um, so yeah. mentally Lori, I think is maybe on the borderline of going over the edge. She's sitting on the fence of going crazy and reality in life. I think she was on the fence on that. I never saw her as being crazy into all of this, but maybe she was sitting on the fence and Chad kind of pushed her over the edge on the crazy side. And so maybe that explains why, okay, I accept that my children had evil spirits and now they're zombies. What I personally think, and we, Lori and I talked about this several times on the phone and in person, that she knew the seven years of tribulation was going to be horrific. She knew it. And I talked about it all the time and how bad it'll be. And she always said she didn't want her kids to experience that. Do you? Would you want your kids to experience that? No. And you can't protect them in that. If we have no government, no lawlessness, an EMP, and if we have an EMP in this country, let me tell you, in the first year, 90% of America is dead. In the first year, we go back to the 1800s and it'll be just horrific. And she didn't want that for her kids. No parent on this planet. I don't want it for my kids. Nobody was. So I think Deep down, she thought she was protecting them, maybe, and not letting them go through it. Chad says the earthquake's going to be in November, October, November, and your kids are going to have to deal with this. She didn't want that. Now he adds on, well, they're now zombies, and you don't want them to deal with it. So I think, I think she, maybe she felt she was doing the right thing and not letting him have to go deal with the second coming and what horrible things are going to happen. And to her children, and they have to deal with it. Um, so I think she felt she was being um, taken the power away from everybody else and her children and uh, having them to go through this and taking their lives because she didn't want them to go through it. That's how I think about it. Maybe that explains something about her and what she did. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. You know, so Visions of Glory, I have concerns listening to it. I see a lot of Lori and Chad's belief system in the book. A couple things for our audience to understand. This is still, I would say, a popular book among like-minded people like you. Is that fair to say? People that have your interest in prepping or, yeah. or believe in sort of that these days of tribulation and the, and the collapse of the financial institution, you know, all this stuff, book of revelation. So there's a bit of a political, I feel like there's a little bit of a political vibe to it too. We'll get into that in a minute, Okay. but, <laughs> um, but you go to, again, I, I do, I don't think it's something discussed in, church and I'll share you my communication with Tom Harrison here in a second. Cause he sent me something, but I'm on Facebook groups that discuss this book. I'm very respectful in these groups. I appreciate that they allow me to be there, but people believe it literally. Many people believe this literally. There's actually a post where people write, do you believe this is literal? And people say, yes, yes. You believe it's literal that the things in this book are going to happen 
the book has high reviews on Amazon, thousands. Really? Thousands of reviews. I think over four stars. Tom Harrison faced excommunication for this book in 2014. I actually have, he sent me a letter he wrote in order to not be excommunicated for this book. I did hear about that. Okay. Yeah. The book, he starts the book by referring to a dear friend that's an apostle who I know who that is. That's Neil Maxwell. Neil Maxwell was in his ward. That's his congregation. So in other words, they're forced to know each other because they go to church together. They live by each other. So it, one of the 12 apostles who's now deceased is Neil Maxwell. And he refers to him throughout the book as his dear friend. And the first thing he writes is, I told Neil Maxwell, my dear apostle friend, about my visions. And Neil Maxwell told me pretty much not to share it. At least that's how I read the beginning of the book, not to share it. So now here's a book <laughs> of my vision. Well, it was. He said to share it until, what, the time was right? Um, something. I can't remember what it was, but um, he, oh, he was given a time that, um, I don't know if it, a, a celestial being came to him and said, it's time to write the book or what? It, it was something like that. I don't know, but it was after Neil A. Maxwell had passed. Yeah, it was the book. a while after this experience that he wrote the book. It was several, several years. Yeah. Here's the letter. I, I will definitely not read the full letter, but I do want to discuss some things with you. Oh, in this I... letter. I won't bore everyone with all of it. It's a three-page letter. I... Signed by... Just show you. Oh, where's the last page? Oh, signed by. Okay, it's blurry. We ha I have the blur filter on. Signed this by Tom. Probably Tom. A and more than anything else, huh? What did you say? I said, was this book a more of a curse to him? Then something. I don't know. I no. I think I think he. I think he's proud he wrote it. Okay. I know. I know that he was meeting with Julie Rowe and Chad in his office. Mm. So I've heard that from multiple sources, by the way, not from Tom, but I've heard from multiple sources very close to Tom and very close to Chad that he was meeting with Chad and Julie Rowe. And in this letter he had to, so he was originally receiving financial benefit from this book and was speaking at these conferences, these conferences I mentioned, I think it was before preparing to people was like created, but like yeah. preparing to people before John Pontius died of, of cancer. Uh, he, John Pontius would interview him and introduce him as Spencer, Tom Harrison. And that's sort of what got the attention of the brethren who then he faced excommunication. Um, and they pretty much told him, you need to disavow the book and you need to, um, you need to not be associated with anymore. Like you can't make financial, you can't mm. have any financial say, and you need to stop speaking, which he's done a decent job of that, I think. But, um, he does write that. He says, I don't want to give the impression I'm throwing John Pontius under the bus. However, I can only be responsible for that, which I actually relayed to him and experienced for myself the remainder of John's work and capacity for writing and his placing my experiences into appropriate context and timeline, you know, is on him, which I felt he was kind of throwing him under the bus there. And a, a dead man can't talk. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, so I didn't think that was very fair. But the part I wanted to write was... I disclose that I am Spencer, the person who the majority of my account of this account is written about. I have been asked here to discuss the origins and pr my present feelings associated with this book. This is March 23rd, 2014. He explains how he met John. He said, shared his experiences with John. He sees, he sees far more clearly that it would have been a better to follow the counsel of elder Neil Maxwell, a member of our ward. When he said to me, in quotes, Brother Tom, do not try and interpret these things or read into them. He counseled me that I should wait and see and experience these things in proper timing of the Lord. 
Then he states, from the start, I do not or have not seen myself or visions of glory. Wait, let me repeat that. I want to get that right. From the start, I do not or have not seen myself or visions of glory, the book, as attempting to speak for the church or saying this is in any way doctrinal or a true account of what we as a people have in store for us. It was and is experiences given to me alone, not meant to be generalized into what will happen to the church or people as a whole. I believe much of it is a metaphor or analogy and should be taken as such. That's what I wanted to read to you because as you pointed out, you, you see some things as literal, but here he is sort of denouncing the book to his leadership. I want to create that context. You know, this is 2014. I want to reiterate the context in which he's writing this to be fair, but he's saying that it's a metaphor or analogy. And he sent that to me a year ago hmm. when I started asking him questions. So I sent you a copy of the letter? Yes. Yeah. Well, like I said at the beginning, when you and I talked, you and I can go to a movie and see the exact same movie, interpret it differently. So right. when, he, when I read these books, you know, it's their interpretation of what they saw. It doesn't mean it's literal to me in any way. And I think Lori and Chad and a lot of those people took it as literal to them. And um, then they there's gaps, of course, in that when you do that, there's gaps and they kind of filled in the gaps with their own ideas and own ideology. And from there, it really went offline. OK, you know what I'm saying? I think so. They have I want to clarify it because I do want to genuinely understand when you say you believe it's literal, you're not saying that it's, there isn't I metaphor and analogy in the book. It's his experience. Yeah, it's not doctrine. They it's not doctrine. They thought, they looked at it as doctrine. That's where you he go. Did. That's and when some, you, a lot of people do, I think. Not you. Yeah, not they, you. You can't. You have to look at it as entertainment and enjoyment. And I like it that he says he saw the future. I kind of believe he did. And it's his interpretation. Well, I can take that and look and then say, okay, Braxton, if that's his future, you know, be prepared for this and have this and that. But I'm not going to take it as scripture. And I'm like, this is how it is for me in my life. They did that. But like I said, when you do that, you have little gaps and you kind of fill it in with your own ideology. And I think they did that. So they took it a little bit above and said, okay, these um, bad spirits entering people's bodies are, he didn't call it, but we're going to call it zombies. And you can't overcome being a zombie. So you have to be put to death. You know, they just did. I think they did something like that. Uh, I think Chad did something like that. Okay. Maybe they did all together and talked about it and, and it came up with the same idea. I'm not quite sure. But anybody that takes any of these books literal and takes it as doctrine and gospel, you're way off offline, off key. Okay. Thank you. Can I, I know I've kept you already longer than I said. I, I still have some more questions for you, but can I just share some? What, what, what did Adam want to ask me? Or you to ask me? Because he had asked me. So what would he, did he want you to ask me? He wanted me to ask you about uh, your book and your prediction about the end of the world when you think <laughs> the end of the world might be. It's funny and because and I even talk about that, that um, I think the first chapter was, you know, I said, I think it was in Matthew. I, somebody will correct me on this, but it was nobody knows the time that Jesus Christ will come. Nobody knows it. Not even, not even the angels in heaven know it. That's and I, true. That's great. I don't want to know that day. I want to know the seven years of tribulation before there. So I said, let's have fun and predict and guess the dates. You know, we were, we're not going to try and decide when Jesus Christ comes. We just want to know the tribulations and the years of that. And, um, you know, all these books, they all, they don't have a date, but they all, kind of predict kind of a time 
Um, and I've never done that. I've never wanted to say, because when you start telling people that what you think the future is, it's the worst thing you could do because it, it won't come true. It's your ideology. I mean, honestly, it could be this next year. It really could with the way the world's going. It could be this next year. The, a, a lot of this, these books talk about a presidential cycle. And it could be this next year. I mean, look at with um, Trump running again. And everybody that wants Trump in because they feel that their the election was stolen from them. And then like me, I have one vote. And when, if you steal that one vote, I'm not going to let you steal it again. And I think a lot of people are thinking that. And so and this administration and this government now isn't going to let Trump in no matter what. Um, the only other people that had their. Um, um, presidential competition arrested was Mao, Pol Pot, Stalin, Hitler. They had the opposition arrested. And so you could say with what's going on in the world today, that tribulation can, this tribulation can start this next year. We could have a full on war because of um, if Trump, is, if he's cheated out of election and, and all his, the people um, that want Trump in can start a civil war. We don't know. So that can start it off. It could be 10, 20 years in the future. I really don't know. But I like I worry, to be Yeah, I worry about a civil war. I'll be honest. Yeah. We have a very divided country right now. Very. Were so, you Were you at the Capitol on January 6th? I was at the U, uh, U, Utah Capitol on January 6th. The Utah Capitol. Yeah. Okay. I, I used to get I used to give tours it, of the nation's capital. It was a heartbreaking thing for me to see. It was horrible. Yeah. What happened in there? Yeah, it was sad. So you're at the Utah Capitol mm -hmm. on January 6th. Yeah, I did an interview up there for the oh. radio station. Or yeah, the TV station. Okay. Um there was in sort of being concerned about the stolen election. Yeah, but I wasn't there holding flags. I wasn't, um, you know, chanting. Uh, I, me and a buddy went up there, um, kind of a support to the Constitution. And um, um, I did my an interview up there about it and how I felt about it. And um, it wasn't really like, uh, oh, I want this whole thing torn down and Trump was really, truly elected. Um I have my own personal beliefs on the whole thing uh, and uh, what went on with that. But it was um, um, my first kind of demonstration of my First Amendment. Does that make sense? I've never demonstrated my First Amendment. and I felt I got to do it there. So, yeah, I went to the U.S. capital of Utah. Not the U.S. America capital, the Utah. Capital. The Utah. Yes, I, I know. And they look very similar. The Utah the capital was built to look like our yeah. nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, just a lot smaller. <laughs> yeah, you know, Ch Chad, also in the speech we have, that he gave um, the day he met Lori at the Preparing a People Conference in St. George that we have at Hidden True Crime, that he, he actually mentioned the presidential elections and um, shadow government of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, and then that it was a miracle of God that Trump was elected. Of course, this was back in 2018 that he gave this speech. So I've seen Obama there. <laughs> I've seen Hillary Clinton there. They're not going away. They're, whether they get reelected or they just continue their parallel shadow government, I don't know. <laughs> but they are part of the coalition, and that. It's really what they tried to do the previous eight years before Trump was elected. And I, I do believe President Trump, it was a miracle uh, that he became president. Otherwise, we would probably be headed right into these tribulations. Would you say that's a like, a sort of a similar like-minded belief among the prepping community? He's getting all that from... Um, oh, shoot. I can't remember now. All the books are bleed into me together, but the, the, um, 
one of the books talks about that and having oh. um, there was a prophecy that the second coming started when there was a president that wasn't of European descent. So, and Barack Obama's not of European descent. So they automatically assumed it was Barack Obama. And now I remember Chad saying, um, um, oh, that God was answering the prayers and didn't start the second coming with Barack Obama. And that's why Trump was elected. I mean, something ridiculous and stupid. But all that is um, about Barack Obama and that being the last president of the United States was all because of a book. And oh, it'll pop into my head which one it was. Yeah, I'd be, I would be very curious. And if we can't think of it here, I'd love to hear. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, um, I would love. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you right now. What it yeah, was. look at that. Thank you. Yeah, I can always edit this so that, you know, once okay, you get good. it or whatever. My glasses, my old man glasses here. Because I do, I do believe that Chad took everything from a lot of places, including visions of glory. You know, yeah. I do believe he took everything from other people. He was very, he was the opposite of creative. <laughs> no, he was. That's all he did was take it from all these books and put his own thing together and then called it his own kind of, which was a charlatan. Did you ever read? Um, Sarah Manet's book. That's who I thought Michelle McDermott was when no. you mentioned her. I was thinking of Sarah Manet, and I I do know about her. I've never read her book. Yeah, she she's was. the one that writes about how she overcame and was able to forgive someone in her family for sexual abuse. Is that yeah. correct? It was a very powerful book. I loved her book because of that. It was very powerful, and uh, she was an LDS. But after this, she sought out religion and it was the mormon church that she said was the true church i found it very interesting hmm. i think she's passed on now oh she moved to Utah, but her book was good yeah i yeah i believe there were other people discussing were these books popular in your family in general was it just no. you and lori no <laughs> just you and lori yeah i mean our uh, summer was a little bit involved in it. My brother, uh, BJ, was a little bit involved in it, but not like Lori and I. Okay. Um, and Alex seemed to get involved. Yeah, Alex is another story with all that. See, Alex was always... Look, Alex had a rough life, a really, really hard life. And um, a, a lot of sexual sin in his life. Uh, he just couldn't get on the straight and narrow path. He just had a very turmoil life. He just couldn't get his sense of being. He was always like that. Now, when um, Chad came along and told him that he was the angel, um, Laman and Lemuel, in the first book of Nephi, right? When um, they were beating Nephi, with a stick and an angel came down and stopped them. And why are you smiting your brother, your younger brother with a rod? Correct. He, that was um angel. I can't remember the angel, but he was told that he was that angel. That was him in a past life. Oh, wow. And he was a protector. And now he's on this earth because you come to earth several times and diff, you know, to gain experience, which I like to think of that as a, a good idea. Um, I got it right here. This is uh, President George Albert Smith's vision. Okay, it wasn't a book. It was a vision pr from President George Albert Smith. He was a prophet of the yeah. Elder Church. And he said, and there will be a non-white president leaving office. Okay. Um the Shermoth, the Blood Moons, oh, th that she's adding that in there. But he said that the new president will not take office. So uh, um, basically uh, the non-white president. He's saying that because I don't think he's, he was saying it's a black president. He was saying of not European descent, right? And we're all here in America of European descent. Right. Well, Barack Obama is not from what everybody says. He's from Kenya. Right. That's his not that it was born there. I'm not gonna go there. I'm just saying that was his um heritage is Kenya, not European. 
And so Albert Smith said a non-white president leaving office, meaning a non-European. And the new president that will be elected will not be able to take office. So he'll go through an election, not take office, and um, because the, 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 the country will be destroyed before he takes office. So that's what that was. Okay. You know, I, I Googled just now because I wanted, I was like, I'm pretty sure he's part, I mean, English, Scottish, Irish, Welsh, German. Um, yes, he's African-American. He has a white ancestry, but he does have European heritage. Yeah. Well, that's what they just, that's what he says. But so, it's what how they're interpreting this. Well, th so they're thinking, you know, whenever you see something that, what was that in the late 1800s? Um, when George you Albert so Smith. Bad, you want to know the future so bad and you see a non-white president. So you're saying, oh, well, that's it. He doesn't have European descent. Well, he does because his grandmother was white and she's of European descent. Um, so the next thing people are saying, not from any of these books, in the circles, I hear, because everybody likes to predict that um, um, Joe Biden will not finish his term. Kamala Harris will be president and she is not of European descent. Oh, wow. I don't know if that's true. I've never looked it up because I've never cared to. But this is, these, these are the the political beliefs going among the circles. Well, just that uh, they're just trying to interpret his. George um, Albert Smith's specific prophecy here. Right. And saying that's what's going to happen. Um, Biden, which who knows? Honestly, he can drop dead tomorrow as old as he is. And, and then Kamala Harris. Is, we all could. Yeah. And, he, <laughs> and then she will, the next president will be elected, but never take office. I don't know. I don't know if she has any white or, or European descent. I don't know. But there's a lot of superstition per se around presidents and the presidential cycle. Yeah. And... Uh huh. Okay. 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 We'll go back. We're done with that. Yeah. No, thank you. I, I want to play a couple of these, you know, just to explain where I see some similarities between Lori's belief system and visions of sure. glory. This is the one where I feel like it kind of implies a lot of the similar beliefs of Lori and Chad. And, and I know you've read this book, so I'd love your take. Okay. By this time, every translated person had his or her own portal, but there was a learning curve to using it. For an inexperienced person, they could only travel so far and would have to walk or obtain other transportation to go beyond that. Some newly translated people would go out on their missions and then become overwhelmed by what they saw, and with fear or sorrow in their hearts, they could not return via the portals, and thus pollute Zion. They had to begin their journeys back to Zion afoot, awaiting the time when they could regroup their faith and overcome their fear, so that their portals could bring them back home. All of us began serving the Lord in this way, with little knowledge of what we were doing. We all went out and taught and blessed those to whom we were assigned, and then brought them home by boat, on foot, or by whatever means were available. As we learned how powerful our gifts were, and as by greater faith and greater experience in obedience we obtained full use of the translated state, we began to be able to bring the pure among them through the portals directly into Zion. Those whom we gathered this way were perfectly pure in heart prior to our coming to them. Any self-interest or impure desire would simply stop the portal from working, and we would have to leave them to find their own way to Zion. Even for us, the first citizens of Zion, this was our journey, the systematic stripping away of everything we possessed, and everything we thought we needed to survive. It was this process that had purified us, and taught us how magnificent life is with total confidence in our loving God. It was the only way to learn this exalting form of purity. Those whom we found ready to join us, the very elect of God, had submitted to this purifying process already during the course of their lives, and we brought them to Zion singing songs of everlasting joy. These pure hearts were the ones whom Isaiah proclaimed we would bring back on our shoulders into Zion, singing songs of everlasting joy. These did not sleep or slumber or come in haste and did not unlatch their shoes. We brought them through the portals with joy into Zion, but they were the vast, vast exception. We also learned that agency was forever in force. 
and being translated did not eliminate the possibility of incorrectly using our agency. I don't have knowledge of any translated person turning to evil and losing their status and their salvation, but I did hear of a few who learned by hard experience that they had to diligently maintain their stature of righteousness, or the gifts and the portal would cease to work. Oops, and I was still going, but oh well, you get the point. I yeah. think it was portals, translated beans, and of course, forgive the like AI voice. They could have gotten a better voice there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think uh, uh, there's two things I'd love to talk about. Please. One was um, the trans translated beings. Please. So when you read the book, that is really, really an awesome thing. Um, for any Christian, they know what translating is. You, you, you translate and you turn into a, a more of a spiritual being, more of your own spirit, because we can't meet God in a, in a physical body. It's in a spiritual body that we can meet God. Jesus Christ is different. This is God I'm talking about. And so translated beings are closer to that. Lori always talked about she's going to be translated. She's going to turn. Now, in Spencer's book, he talks about him uh, through the book. He's slowly translating into a translated being. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? He's slowly um, morphing into a translated being in his journey. Correct. And where he stopped needing food for substance. Mm -hmm. And um, he thought more clear. He had more energy. He felt younger. And um, which is all true things as a translated being. I mean, think about it. You know, you're, you're, you, the, the human body isn't weighing you down with its limitations. And Lori talked about her being translated, that she was slowly. A lot. Yeah, a lot. she felt she was slowly translating to where Lori wasn't even eating. She was like, I don't need food anymore. And she did that in jail, too. And I'm like. How long before she gets hungry and realizes she's not translated? <laughs> but I think she kept it going. Um, that I, 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 I accuse um, her, again, for lack of a better word, going crazy a little bit. Her thinking she's translated. She wanted to be so bad that she was trying to convince herself that she was translating. Okay. Almost delusional, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so the um, uh, um, mental, uh, her mental um, capacity, not mental capacity, her um, mental being on that. I think she, she was mentally um, not thinking correctly and, and mental, her mental health was deteriorating. That's a better word. Her mental health was deteriorating and uh, thinking that she was being translated. Now, let's talk about the portals. I happen to believe in that. Um, quite a bit, and I, really, I'm, yeah. Wow. Well, I've each, never heard of portals until oh, this book. I want to say, really, um, a lot of books talk about it. Not these six books that you and I are talking about it, because this is about the Mormon religion and 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 that. But a lot of books that I've talked to, I've read about um, um, near death experiences talk about portals. And a portal is something in the spirit world, what we build ourselves. You built one for yourself. I built one for myself. And the portal is the way we get from heaven, um, the spiritual world to earth. We don't just fly through space. We have a portal that transports us. And it's personal. It's personal to us because we made it. Nobody else can be given this portal and use it. So we have our own portal. So that's what Spencer's talking about in his book. Now the portal isn't just between heaven and earth, but he was using it in earth time, like uh, right. portal to, I think it was the North pole or South. One of those he was like a lot of cars in Canada going on in his book. Yeah. He was and up he would portal from different places on earth and he had to go to different places and he used his portal and a portal only worked if you were righteous which i believe too and um you can use it for other things you know um god is a time traveler and he does it through a portal he doesn't just fly through space he has a portal also and um, he travels through space. And we know that he, because and through time, because he's shown people the future and he showed them the past in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible. Mm 
And so we know he's a time traveler and he does that through a portal. So I actually believe that we each have our own personal portal and we'll use it again once we died because we used it to get here on earth. Now, can we use it as human beings? No, you have to be, I think, like Spencer was partly translated and he could start using his portal. It's a special gift that we've built ourselves to come to earth. So what do you think of Chad and Lori using portals to visit one another in each other's closets? Cause that's sort of this ongoing I joke. Mental health. I think that's completely mental health and her children visiting her and all that stuff. It's just a mental health decline of hers. Do you think that a portal could actually do that in the days of tribulation, transport people to different parts of I guess translated being. Translated is you're a human body translating into uh, um, a spirit. Now, um, let's talk about this. In the second coming, uh, a lot of people will be alive when Jesus Christ comes. And they will be translating or a translated being i think um oh shoot i lost my trans thought on this what i was going to tell you um anyways darn it i had a I'm good i'm not the only one because i just <laughs> but just ask me another question about it yeah 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 so so portals do you believe that you were telling me about what a translated being is. That's really helpful because um, I don't think a lot of people understand. And then are you saying that when we're translated or when one is translated, they can use the portal to like, could that be feasible that Lori could go into her closet and use a portal she created to go visit Chad if, if they were being and doing something righteous, something a work of God? Yes. But she's not doing, she's not righteous and she's not doing anything for God. So no, that's completely, um, her, her, her mental health decline. This is, this is a big question I want to ask. And it's funny because this is a major book of revelation. I, I feel like most Christian religions, um, believe in the 144,000. Yeah. I've asked many, many people, well, LDS, what it what the 144,000 means. So what, Braxton, are the 144,000? The 144, gosh, I hope I get this right. This is what I've been taught and learned. But the 144,000 isn't, a lot of people think there's only going to be 144,000 left here on earth when Jesus Christ comes. And that is not true. The 144,000 is you have the 12 tribe of Israel. And what is that? Uh, there's 12,000 people in each tribe. So the Jewish tribe has 12, the, the um Ephraim tribe has 12,000. These are 12,000 people of each of the 12 tribes that are kind of going to be um, leaders and teachers of the rest of the people. So I don't know how many people there are going to be here when Jesus Christ comes. Um, 10 million, 100 million, I have no idea. But the, tw the 144,000 are kind of leaders and teachers of the rest of the people. And so going back to one of the first things you said, wiping the wicked from the earth. Is that what happens before the second coming? That yeah, that's the seven years of tribulation. And, so, and the righteous survive and the wicked are destroyed. Yes. The wick, the righteous are taken off the earth. And then the, the last thing that happens to this earth is another planet comes extremely close to it and burns it. And the whole planet as it turns just burns completely everything, every tree root, every living organism, everything. Um, the rapture is where everybody is taking off this earth and goes into heaven right before the very end. And the very wicked that have, are left will be burned to a stubble. You want to stubble. Wow. You want to read a really good book? It's called, um, and the moon shall turn to blood. Oh, you know what? I will text it to you after this. And it's about um, um, the Noah. And you know, all the things that happened, not Noah. Um, Moses? 
<laughs> Thank okay. you. I know, I know. I get those two mixed up a lot too. That's like, maybe he means Moses. Moses, right? The frogs and the hell uh, coming down and burning all the crops and the Red Sea splinting, you know? Yeah. Um, it all correlates with how this earth would act if another earth came very, very, a planet came very, very close to earth. And it would have a gravitational pull where it would split like uh, the earth in half, like the equators and pull the waters apart. And then a lightning strike would hit between the two and release it and all the oceans would go back up. And he did a correlation of that with Moses and the second coming. And it's awesome. A lot of people don't know about that book. It was given to me as a gift for my wife's parents. Oh. And I read that and I loved it. It was really interesting. I will send it to you in a text. you got to read it. It's pretty Thank you. I will. Thank you. I appreciate that, Braxton. Let me play this other thing. This was an interesting part of Visions of Glory. Okay. The most common was an assignment to use the portal. The most common was from Jesus Christ himself. My office was in the temple, and only one door separated us. If he needed me, he came to me through that door. I always knew when he was coming. I never went from my office into the Holy of Holies. The second way was by a calling from the prophet or one of the apostles. These calls were to more local service, dealing with some need within their stewardship. They could have gone themselves, and often did through their own portals, but delegation is a true principle, and others were often sent. The third way I might use the portal was by a prompting from the Holy Ghost. This usually happened when I was initially sent by Jesus Christ to begin a work. I would then return to Zion, and the Holy Ghost would prompt me when I needed to return to them to rescue or assist them in continuing their journey to Zion. As my spiritual maturity grew, I found that I needed less and less to see or preview my mission through the portal. My faith and ability to receive revelation and to be guided in the moment became much more powerful than sight or prior knowledge. This was to actually have the mind of God. I think... It was the very beginning that I was most interested in where it says that Jesus Christ had an office next to him in the, the temple and that they would portal to one another. Is, is Jesus Christ going to, is that, is that a thing? <laughs> Jesus Christ is going to be here. Um, no, I don't think so. I, cause he comes during the second coming now, but that makes sense of a portal between his office. A portal basically isn't a door jam and he's going through the next door. The portal could be a hundred billion light years away. And he's using the portal to go to Jesus Christ and get his information and come back to his office. The Holy of Holies is a room that they have in the temple. And opposably, the Holy of Holies is where the prophet prays and, and gets guidance from Jesus Christ. Because really, the church of Jesus Christ is the church of Jesus Christ, and he's the one directing it. So the prophet gets his, when he prays, he prays in the Holy of the Holy, and that's where he gets Jesus Christ's answers. To okay. So that makes sense to me that he has that. The portal he has to go through isn't a door jam, like I said, in going to the next office where Jesus Christ is. He's probably going to heaven or the spirit world, the celestial kingdom. I'm not quite sure, but he's going where Jesus Christ is to get direction. Okay. Does that Thank make sense? It does make sense. Yes. Thank you. I hope I'm sense. interpreting this right of Spencer's book. You hope what? I hope I'm interpreting that right. Well, as he stated himself, it's a metaphor and analogy, which means I think we can all interpret it the way. Yeah. we, And that's how I interpret it. So Lori and Chad interpret it the same way the portals. They just assume that they are being translated, turning into a spirit, and their body is turning into a spirit where you die and leave the mortal body here on earth and the spirit goes to heaven, they feel they're uh, turning into a spirit with the human body, which people will do the very righteous. That's not Chad. I want to go back to Alex really quickly because you said some things that were interesting about him. Um, you said he had a very, very hard life. You mentioned his sexual sin, which I've, I've heard that from other people. Um, but why was his life in general hard? He didn't really, he was like a nomad and really had no direction. He got married once shortly. Uh, he didn't have 
a, a path and we all have a path in life, right? Uh, after high school, we go to college, um, we find the girl of our dreams, we marry her, we have a plan of a career, um, how many children I'm gonna have, we all have a plan. And Alex really never had a plan. Uh, may, he may have, he just didn't follow one, so he was really all over the place. Uh, there was a lot of sexual sin in his life, and he had a hard time with that. Um, the Mormon church, and, well, all Christianity is is pretty, uh, um, follows the Ten Commandments, and um, but the church is really strict on the sexual sin, and he just, he really had a problem with that. So he really felt like, uh, maybe I'm going to hell. I'm not going to make it to heaven. I've tried so hard. I keep failing. I keep falling on my face. We all do as humans. Um, he, I think he just took it really, really hard. And Chad comes along and him and Lori look at him as a savior, almost as a prophet. He's a false prophet. And in the second, the second coming, the, 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 the Bible talks about many false prophets. Hmm. Well, that's Chad Daybell. He came in as a false prophet. And he's telling um, Alex, you know, you're forgiven. You're going to be forgiven. I forgive you for all this. And we could start fresh. Well, anybody that's had a hard life and then and feels guilty of all the stuff they've done, that sounds pretty, pretty awesome. You know, and um, uh, this is just one of many of your lives. So the church doesn't talk about this at all, um, having more than one life. And they, t they felt, and I'm not quite sure why, and I, I have no proof of this, but uh, other than what they've read, I have no proof that they actually um, read any of this, but they felt we had many lives. Which when you sound, you know, why we came to this earth is to gain a body and um, gain experiences because we chose Heavenly Father's plan. You know, Satan had his plan of um, coming to this earth and he'll make everybody be good and go to heaven. And Jesus Christ's plan was have everybody come to earth, screw up, but I will give them a savior, which is Jesus Christ, and repent of our sins and make it to heaven. And some people won't. Well, a third of the hosts of heaven went with Satan because he promised them he would make them return to heavenly father and be a God. Jesus Christ said, all the people that are here on earth, all of us here on earth chose Jesus Christ's plan. Right? Right. We're all that's, that's, this is more, this is, uh, LDS doctrine that you're sharing. This is not. Yes, this is all Christianity. Um, that we chose Jesus Christ's plan in here on earth. But LDS L LDS doctrine, though, um, theology really focuses on this. I yeah, think it does. It does. Yeah. And um, so, um, Lori and Chad and Alex thought they had multiple lives. They've been here on earth several times, and um, um. Chad told them that his sins are forgiven, that he was actually a protector in other lives. He was an awesome, awesome uh, advocate for Jesus Christ and God and, and protected people that needed it. And he was a superhero. Basically, he was a yeah. superhero in another life. Well, that makes you feel pretty good from somebody who you think is a prophet and talks to Jesus Christ daily. Right. And so it made Alex feel good. And so they said, hey, Alex, you need to protect Lori because that's why you were here put on this earth at this time. And you need to do this and that and that and this. And he did it. He did he, do it. He felt like um, they were uh, forgiving him for his sins. And he was here. He had a purpose and a mission. All of us here on earth, you know, we don't know our purpose and our mission. We just kind of float through life and go through our experiences. Alex was told his purpose and his mission. And he just did what he was told. Okay. Thank you for, for sharing about Alex a little bit with us. The whole thing is so tragic. Can I, I can't imagine. Well, let me ask you this. You gave Lori the visions of glory book, correct? I, 
think if I remember right, because this was like in 2010, I think I called her and I'm like, you got to read this book. I'm pretty sure I did. But so you like, recommended it, recommended it, was it. a long time ago. I recommended so many books to so many people. I don't, I can't sure. 100% say I did, but yeah, I, th I remember it as that way. I'm like, you got to read this book. Did she ever introduce you to any book? Um... Yeah, but they were books I've already read. Okay. So, You're like, I got, I'm so ahead of you, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never said that, but yeah, uh, she did. She called me a couple of times. She's like, you got to read this book. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I'm like, yeah, I read it. Or been there, of, done that, Lori. Yeah, I Jump did. on board. Do you believe in multiple probations then? We were just talking about that. I want to say yes and no. Now, we've never been taught that. But also, I think about it like this. If if I'm here because God, well, I want to be like God. We all do want to be like God. How can I have one earth experience and know everything? I can't. I grew up in an awesome home. My parents are still married. They still love each other. I grew up on uh, middle class, tons of love and support. Uh, a friend I grew up with, his parents were on drugs. When he graduated high school, he went on drugs. He is an alcoholic. He floats around. He's kind of um, homeless. Um, I still get word about from him. He's had a hard life. Yeah, he's had a hard life. And so I'm like, he hasn't had any of my experience and I haven't had any of his. So how can I expect to know everything like God does like to be like God? So maybe we do come here several times. I, I don't know. I don't want to say, no, we definitely don't. And I said, yes, we have multiple lives. I'm, I'm floating zero on that one. Cause our church doesn't preach that. No, right? they don't. No, they but don't. Again, let me explain this. If the Mormon church did or any religion did, Hey, you have multiple lives. Oh, good, because gee, I've really screwed this life up. So you know what? I I'm not going to take the hard road and follow Jesus Christ's teachings. I'm just going to do what I want, and I'll be better in the next life. That's what we do. You know why? Because we're human. So no religion teaches that. Well, I think Buddhism. I don't know. Um, um, some religions. I think you, they talk about reincarnation, coming back as something else, but not being a human over and over again. There's lots of experiences of people um, that uh, you could watch it on YouTube. There's a TV show about it, um, about people that little kids are talking about this other life they had, little, little kids. And, um, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the TV show, but um, um, like, for example, one little kid, he was like four years old telling his dad he was a World War II pilot and died in his plane and had horrible nightmares. And his dad's all like, oh, yeah, well, what plane did you fly? And he's like, it was a Corsair, dad. And he's like, that's not even a plane. And then he said he looked it up and that was a World War II airplane, a Corsair. And he goes, well, where did you fly? And he goes, I flew it off um, the USS something. This is a four year old kid. He looked it up and it was an aircraft carrier that um, the Corsair flew off of. And, um, and he, his dad asked him, well, who shot you down? And he's like, oh, it was a Japanese dad, of course, you know, stuff he would have never known. So, I mean, so you see stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, maybe there, we do have multiple lives. I don't know. But Lori really believed that. So it, let's go back to Lori's mental health on this. Lori thought she had several lives and she was going to have several more. So if, again, she could have said, well, if I do take my children's life and become a murderer, that's all right, because I could make it up in the next mm. life. Interesting theory. So Interesting theory. Two comes to into play. You know, if they have multiple lives, you know, I already screwed this one up. I know Lori thought that because we all do. You do. I do. Everybody listening to the podcast does. I already screwed up this life so bad. Why be better? Try and be better because it's a hard road. I'll just do what I want and I'll make it up in the next life. Well, I think maybe she thought that too. Hmm. That, I, that's an interesting theory. Throw around. Do you think that, you know, she seems to still be denying any, if, if that was her theory, you'd think she'd confess and be like, you know what? I did this, but I'll have another chance. And she, she's not going there. She's not. But all, again, going back to her mental state, 
she has to keep this up because if she doesn't, she has to admit she murdered her children, her innocent children. Correct. And she doesn't want to do that. So she, her mental health comes into play again. She has to keep it up because if she doesn't, she lets it, she loses everything and loses. She has to admit what she did. And I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. Neither would you. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I think she's car compartmentalizing it for survival's sake. Yeah, totally. Because we do that as humans. It's called normalcy bias. I talked about it in a chapter in my book. You don't want the reality of life, so you normalize it. And then it takes all the boogeymans and the danger and the horribleness away. There's a perfect example of normalcy bias in 2001 during the World Trade Centers. A whole office building was across from the first tower and watch, actually watch the plane because it went by their building. They heard it, watched it slam into there. This is a story of a lady. And they all were screaming because they watched the whole thing and they were evacuating building number two. They all, their whole office went down the stairs because they, I don't know why they're going down the stairs because the elevators were closed or everybody was using them. They're going down the stairs. She got down three flights and said, oh my gosh, I forgot to turn off my computer. She went against everybody back up the stairs to turn off her computer. That's called normalcy bias. She didn't want to notice the horrific thing she just witnessed or it's going to happen to her. So she normalized it as an inconvenience and went and turned her computer off because she was acting like it was a normal thing. So we avoid threats. I think Lori is kind of doing that, a normalcy bias. It's it's normal because she doesn't want to face the reality. Okay. Speaking of that, how has your family been? Have you guys been ex experiencing normalcy bias in this? Have you guys, are you guys okay? What? You didn't just know Lori. You knew Tylee. You knew Charles. You guys have experienced a tragedy. Your wife knew Lori. How are yeah. you guys doing? Um, better after the trial. I think that the, it really split my family. I mean, I am talking really split it and to where I couldn't talk to my mom about it. And I understood my aunt Janie wants to believe her daughter. Of course she does. Cause she doesn't want to think of this actually happened. So my mom is supporting my, her sister, my aunt Jenny, my mom supporting her sister and saying, Lori didn't do anything. This is all when Lori was arrested and, and they haven't found the bodies yet. Right. Pre-trial. So my mom is 100% standing by her sister because she has to, you know, and I'm saying, Hey mom, this is the reality of it. And it, it got to where my mom and I couldn't talk about it anymore. My sister who's on, who agrees with me really couldn't talk to my mom anymore. So we kind of just didn't talk about it. And our kind of family split. Now that the trial's over and everything, I think everything's mending back together with the family and we can talk and be a whole again, but yeah. it's really, really hard, really hard for a while. Yeah. And then to lose, these family members too. Ab absolutely. I mean, Charles was an awesome guy. He had his, he had his faults, but um, like we all do, but um, he was an awesome guy and he didn't deserve to die. Of course, Tylee and JJ didn't deserve to die. I didn't know anything about Tammy, but absolutely she didn't deserve to die. Um, you know, everybody was a, a victim to this, including um, family that wasn't directly involved in it were victims to it. Right. And while your wife didn't ask to be part of this podcast, knowing though that she knows Lori, how, how's she doing? She thinks the same way as I do. You know, I love Lori. Lori is a, is, has been a, just a great cousin in my life and all our experiences together. And I love her and it absolutely breaks my heart of what she is going through because of her actions. And I know deep down, she realizes what she did. She just can't face it. And I understand that uh, because she has to accept what she did. And so she's going to deny it and, and still think she did something that was actually righteous and, and the right thing. But um, um, it, it just breaks my heart. And I pray for her every day. And I pray for my aunt Janie and my cousin Summer because they've 
gone through the ringer with this whole thing too. You know, they're, they're products of the, she, they're victims also, and they're products of what happened and what Lori did and Chad Datebell did. And it, it's just a, a sad deal for everybody all the way around. But my family is doing a little bit better. They are all, they are mending. I'm glad. Well, yeah. And you've even been able to speak out and I'm really grateful for the amount of time you spent with me tonight. You know, one other question, and, and if you want to do no comment, it's okay. I don't know if Rex and Adam told you, or, you know, I, I don't think Adam's listening. I only think Rex has, but I did interview another cousin of yours, Megan Connor. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've listened, but I, I do want to give everybody the opportunity because she shared things about the Cox family, about the Connor family. If there's anything you want to say to that interview, to say it, but I don't know if you even know about it or what you oh, want to share. I didn't listen to it. My cousin Preston, who's my age and Megan's brother, him and I are extremely close. We talk weekly. And um, so I knew all about it. He told me, um, here's the thing. I love Megan. She's, she's, uh, was a great cousin too, but she doesn't know that much about, uh, the family. They lived in Connecticut and North Dakota. So we never saw them. I saw them growing up maybe a handful of times when they'd come out on vacation. So they saw um, Aunt Jenny and Uncle Barry and spent time with Lori a handful of times through our whole childhood. So they, she really doesn't know the family all that much. Uh, her biggest beef, I think, is the church. And um, from what I gather, I didn't listen to anything. It just snippets of what her interview was. But um, she has no virility into the family, really. Okay. But but thank you, for, yeah, just for just sharing your perspective. I, I, I always try to be fair and balanced. And, and, I, and I want that as I interview family members. I want everyone to be able to have a voice and to be able to share. Yeah. What do you think happened to, to Alex? Do you believe that Alex passed away naturally? Uh, like the autopsy does say, uh, do you think there's more to it? Gosh, I really, really don't know. Um, there's so many of woulda, shoulda, couldas with that. Um, when he passed away, nobody knew any of the stuff that was going on. So I think uh, Aunt Janie had his body cremated, so they couldn't do any tests. Um, Zulema is... His wife. Yeah, Yeah, she's just really weird. I've never talked to her before. I didn't know even know of her until this all went down. She could control the elements, allegedly. <laughs> I heard those. Again, how did Chad convince her that she had power to control the weather it, it blows me away that he convinced these people of that um so gosh i don't know some of the things that i heard during the trial um you know that he could be the fall guy i think he was at the very end realizing what he did that this was a whole this whole thing was a sham i don't know you know that's my only a personal opinion on that from what i heard from the the courts that maybe he was i think he was starting to realize that this whole thing was a sham but um as far as a murder or dying natural i really don't have an opinion on that i have no idea um, I'd like to think that it was natural because then there's one less murder in the story. But honestly, I don't know. Fair enough. Yeah. Anything else you want to say that you feel like we haven't covered that you feel is important? No, I, everything I thought was important. You asked and talked and we talked about. Yeah, I, I really value everything you shared. I have a lot of questions answered. Um, I like I do. I like, feel a little bit more content. I feel like I understand their belief systems a little bit more, where it stemmed from. It's, it's been helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. I good. I'm glad. <laughs>